Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're going to take a look at Green Thumb Industries, take a look at their pitch deck review to see if they meet our seven tips to a successful investment deck. Number one, will they identify the business plan goals? Number two, do they know their audience? Three, will they understand the market? Four, are they going to identify needs and roadblocks? Number five, do they know what sets the business apart? Number six, will they they introduce the team and products? And number seven, Will they have a uh, call to action, create a summary right uh, at the very end? So with that, we're going to dive into Green Thumb Ministries. With us to help us do that is Katrina Golgowski, angel investor and attorney. Katrina, thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. All right. Uh, I did not know that they had bought uh, Incredible Edibles. That's Bob out of uh, Colorado. So I must have missed that whole acquisition. I didn't know that either. So they've got an agenda here. Don't normally see an agenda, but we're going to look at the opportunities and overviews, strategies, impacts, and performance. Total addressable market of billions, <laughs> Josh. It's got billions. We don't even have a, a word for it yet. Opportunities <laughs> in the cannabis industry. There you go. Your total addressable market. So this is interesting though. At least it compares it to like real things rather than just some like crazy number in the pie in the sky. Tobacco's at 120 billion. Beer's at 110 billion. Cannabis is sitting at 100 billion. Uh, above spirits or liquor at 80 billion and above wine at 70 billion. Not bad. Not bad, cannabis. Not bad. At least it's a realistic chart. <laughs> the compounded annual growth rate, though, uh, is significantly more. You're seeing in um, regulated states, uh, alcohol intake going down. Um, tobacco seems to be kind of wearing off, although vaping is popular. But cannabis's compounded annual growth rate is 20%, and it's much, much higher than all of those. Spirit and wine might be increasing. I think, you know, tobacco is pretty much dead in the water. Microbrews are still increasing, but um, everything else has really kind of found um, its price point there. So that the, the price discovery uh, or growth has already been there because these have been around for a hundred years. And, and I also think that this chart could be a little bit misleading with new legalization. It's a new product. So if it was totally illegal, you had zero users uh, and you go up uh, to 20 users, that's that's a 20% increase. Um, and so while I agree that the um, year over year growth will grow initially, this is not a long term chart. No. It will level off just like all the other products listed on this chart, Josh. Right. Anything else that you're seeing, you know, parabolic, whether it's Bitcoin or otherwise, it's an, you're introducing something new and it has to have a price discovery. So the, the normal supply and demand will find that. But when you have um, all kinds of speculation and, and greed and, you know, it's interesting and new and crazy, people want to go out and try things. That's why you're seeing Illinois with huge amounts of um, you know, basket sizes. When people go in and purchase, there's a, a crazy amount um, that they're spending in Illinois because it's new. But like you mentioned, Katrina, the compounded annual growth rate is not going to be 20% indefinitely. Um, looking at green wave of social and regulatory momentum, you have 68% bipartisan support for legalization. An interesting statistic for, they are publicly traded, so I'm not sure why they really need to kind of go into this much detail to convince their investors that uh, regulation it won't be an issue. Um, but moving on to the next slide, it says that there's still early in the U.S., nearly 20 billion legal market cap and market uh, at discount. So projected market size is 100 billion in the U.S. National leaders in the cannabis consumer products promoting well-being through the power of cannabis. So at a glance, where people come first, they found it in 2014 in Chicago with 200 people, a family of cannabis brands. They've got six uh, consumer product brands distributed across 12 states. They've got 40 stores that are open as of November of 2020 with 96 retail licenses and a growth uh, consensus estimate at around you know 530 million, somewhere around there, which is a huge growth for um, when you compare 2016 or 17, even 18 and 19, it's significantly more. Well, that's due to acquisition of more states coming online. But yes, uh, it is nice to see that they are growing. Right. 
Yeah. I mean, they don't have to plead for your money like MedMen, for example. So yes, to your point, there are new states and that's why you're getting massive amounts of, of new people coming in. Like we mentioned, Illinois, when they went wreck, there were, people were going in there and buying it. And that's where you know this Green Thumb is from. It's from uh, Chicago. So uh, vertically integrated supply chain, it's a great opportunity. So they're looking at production and distribution and retail. So strategy and execution, executing with uh, open scale strategy. So in 2014, try to get their um, early market advantage. 2018 and 19, they were trying to drive revenue. And 2020 is all about scaling. So it looks like they're trying to get sustainable, profitable growth with solid brands, building a foundation for customers, hopefully to get them to come back. Expanding operations through capacity and infrastructure and automation. Something we've been calling for in this industry for a long time. That's the plan. Establish national presence. 45% of Americans with growth opportunities. So it looks like they are uh, West Coast to East Coast. There's some states there that are missing. We've seen some bigger uh, multi-state operators, but they're in California. And, you know, some people might say, who cares about everywhere else? So <laughs> they're, they're in Nevada, they're in Colorado, they're in, you know, Chicago. They've, they've gone into some other places like Massachusetts. Uh, I think that's New Jersey <laughs> and then Florida down there. Pennsylvania too. I get a lot of calls from people wanting a pre-roll um, equipment out of Pennsylvania. So I think Pennsylvania is a sleeper for most folks. Uh, there's a market out there. Investing in consumer product excellence. They've got a portfolio of trusted brands, portfolio assortments uh, from flower, vape, edibles, pre-rolls, concentrates, and health and beauty uh, with some strategic growth priorities. So the brand, that's the consumer driven brand foundations, their operational efficiencies about capacity and automation and their strategic points of distribution is about third parties and owned retail. Uh, I like that they're across a lot of different platforms, Josh. Uh, I, I like the diversification there. Yeah, likewise. It's pretty good kind of round amount of SKUs. And then Incredibles, I know the founder, that guy, you know, Bob with Incredibles has been around for a long time. So if they're grabbing this in Colorado, uh, the edibles brand, then they're getting a lot of uh, really good SOP, a lot of, um, you know, if assuming that Bob is still on the board or at least involved, then they've got a lot of uh, good founding members there. Diversified brand portfolio position to promote a well-being across consumer segments. Um, so they have value, they have premium. Looks like most of them are in between, like kind of all of that. So in between price and comfort. I like it. So Rhythm, that is, uh, I guess, a brand that I haven't really heard of. But that's flour and um, vape and oil, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Premium cannabis flour and 100% full spectrum cannabis vape. Best strain in Chicago and High Times recognized it with enough money because High Times doesn't do anything unless you pay them. So that's not really legitimate feedback. Right. Dog walkers, cannabis pre-rolls. Those look fat. I wouldn't mind puffing on some of those, assuming that it's not like been swept off the floor. But I assume <laughs> since they say that it's, do they say it's premium or did I just make that up? I think I just made that up. Okay. <laughs> I like the packaging. Yeah, I was just going to say, I kind of like the branding. It's it's like dog walker. Like, okay, I'm going to walk my dog. And yeah, I like that. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> All right, Incredibles. Kind of already mentioned these guys. Um, award-winning chocolates and gummies and tarts. Uh, recognized by High Times Cannabis Cup, GQ Magazine, and Cannabis Business Awards. And then the retail experience. So they've got a high-growth retail. Same-store sales exceed 65%. Too bad. 49 stores open as of November. So it looks like they have um, people first employers. I'm not really sure what that means. Uh, making a local impact. Okay, that's great. And then promoting social equity. So um, Chicago and Illinois, they're, they're really big on social equity, which is great. So is Massachusetts. They've been working on that for a really long time. New Jersey also has a social equity program built into it. So hopefully they kind of get uh, on board with that, supporting uh, people that were disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Social equity. Yeah. So Green Thumb, they're growing for good. So they do have that uh, corporate social justice, diversity and inclusion, environmental stewardship and community engagement. This is a great slide. We don't really see all too often uh, that somebody has uh, this in mind, but this is kind of corporate America. This is really, um, I think, the wave of, of 
the cannabis industry moving forward is kind of incorporating more normal corporate um, philosophies into the cannabis industry. And I specifically like that they are breaking down their corporate missions by brand. So it's not confusing. Uh, in, in overall, they support many causes, uh, which is admirable, but to do it in a manageable manner, each brand focuses on a different cause. And so that, that's a smart move on their part, Josh. All right, slide number 26. National Brands uh, Program supports clemency initiatives. That's great. People shouldn't be in prison for, uh, for cannabis, if that's what that's for. <laughs> Leadership team, finally. All right, slide number 27 goes into the founder and chairman, chief financial officer. That's good that they actually have one, which is helpful since they're publicly traded. And a board of directors, diverse backgrounds. That's good. Women, men, people of color. Finally, Financial performance strategy hits milestones in building sustainable, profitable growth. They have a 31% sequential quarterly revenue growth, 55% gross margins, and 34% adjusted operating EBITDA with a $9.6 million net income or $0.04 cents per share. Profitable, Josh? Did you say a profitable cannabis company? I'm going to have to go back and check the notes. I think I did say that. <laughs> Yeah, not bad. I mean, revenue is increasing. Obviously, their their acquisitions are, are uh, working out for them, unlike Canopy, you know, uh, where I've talked a lot of trash about Canopy because going out and spending billions of dollars and having to just write it off because it didn't work out. They were PR and that was the CEO and that's why he's no longer involved. Um, and, and he's running around with uh, psilocybins and trying to do the same thing over in the, the mushroom space. But this is a legitimate company. This is a profitable company. This obviously doesn't have to write off billions from malinvestment. So this is a company I would actually maybe look at being a serious multi-state operator instead of, you know, Canopy deciding to continue to write off billions of your investment. Yeah, th this is very good news. They even have a cap table. Full wow. Full cap table. <laughs> Like, you know, you don't know, you don't see that. I mean, you can get this information uh, premium on Bloomberg, but this is not normally something you could just pull up and take a look at. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And that is it. So they've got some appendix down here. Uh, EBITDA reconciliation. That's kind of nice. Non-GAAP measure. Non-GAAP. That's great. Because GAAP is the generally accepted accounting principles that the U.S. uses, but everyone else in the world uses IFRS. So to use the international financial reporting standards, then you can truly compare this MSO to a Canadian MSO by not by adding non-GAAP measures. So very cool that they did this. They obviously want you to be able to know that they got something that sets them apart by adding non-U.S. financials to compare that to their Canadian counterparts. Yes, very good. Track record, strategically scaling national footprint. So talking about their consumer products and retail businesses across a, a bunch of different states that they're developing and, and uh, infrastructure from Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, Florida, Ohio, Arkansas, Connecticut, Colorado, California, New Jersey, New York, Illinois, Nevada, Maryland. Josh, one of the things that I really like this slide uh, is they've applied for all these licenses, but they did not get all of them hmm. which is one of the things you and i are always talking about about roadblocks and impediments in this industry and this is really increasing the credibility of this company to be honest about it instead of hey we, we have 49 licenses and we're going yay uh it does acknowledge that you don't always get what you want including a cannabis license. So this is excellent. I highly encourage our listeners to, to disclose this type of thing because you and I are looking for that and here it is. Yeah, I'd want to know where you're trying to get into as well as what some of your roadblocks were. And so looking at Arkansas when they applied in 2018 but didn't get a consumer product business or retail business, uh, I'd want to know that. So yeah. Again, that's good, great that they kind of added that in there. So this has been Green Thumbs Investor Presentation. Now's the time for the grade. 
So seven tips to a successful investment deck. Number one, did they identify the business plan goals? They did not tell us definitively how much they are raising or what they're going to use the money for. It is implied uh, every single slide in this 30 some odd page deck reference growth in one way or another. Um, and I want to say, knowing that they're a publicly traded company, it's, it's very hard to um, comply with the SEC regulations. So I understand that. And I understand that they want investors to fund growth, even though they didn't say that, Josh. So I'll give them a point. All right. Number two, do they know their investor audience? Yes, uh, they certainly do. All right. Number three, do they understand the market? I think so. Um, they are successful. They're diversified. Um, they're talking about um, different SKUs for different customer groups. So uh, yeah, they're on a roll here, three in a row. Did they identify needs and roadblocks? Josh, I'm going to give them a half a point here because they did articulate their difficulties uh, in obtaining a license in, in I think it was Alabama. Um, but I did not see anything else about legalization or other licenses that they may have um, difficulty with, any type of risk analysis at all. Um, they got a lot further than a lot of the decks we see, but not quite far enough, Josh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Roadblocks could be simple, like, um, you know, the FDA in the U.S. not uh, allowing for CBD beverages, uh, for example, or uh, some of the issues they might have in Florida, um, for example, trying to grow down there. But yeah, the, I would, I think that's, that's nice of you to give them half a point. <laughs> Number five, do they know what sets the business apart? Do they give their secret sauce? Josh, this is where I think that this pitch deck really struggled. They did talk about their corporate awareness and their corporate missions and their products, but they, I did not see a single reference to a competitor. Uh, they're an MSO. There are many other MSOs out there at this point. What are you doing different than someone else? Uh, and I didn't see any of that in there, Josh. No. Um, you know, I know some of those brands, so I'm, I'm aware of their ability to go out and grab, you know, top brands, but, uh, in the deck, people don't really understand that, uh, unless you're really deep in the industry. So I would think that they should have added something to tell them to tell the investor and the audience, uh, why they were better than all these other MSOs. Is it, is it their partnerships, you know, with people like Incredibles? Is it the brand? Is it the uh, repeat customers? Like, why would somebody want to invest in this, in Green Thumbs, in this company versus all of the other competitors? So um, what are we giving them? Is it, is it, did they miss the mark on that entirely? I, without reference to a single competitor, uh, I, I really, I really struggle with that because uh a laudable corporate mission and fancy packages, it, it no longer sets your business apart at, at this stage of, uh, of the cannabis industry. Yeah. It, 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 you need more. All right. Zero it is. They introduced the team. They introduced some of the products. Probably not every single skew. Is it enough for a full point? Uh, yes. Um, not only did they talk about their management team, which include finance, thank you, God, uh, and legal, thank you, God. Uh, but they also talked about their board of advisors, which really did reflect a depth of understanding, uh, which is how they got this pitch deck put together. Uh, and so I'm going to give them a full point. And their products were also described, uh, including the spectrum where the products are. Mm -hmm. All right. That gives us a, um, what does that give us? A 5.5 out of seven. That is a 79. Yeah. Rounding up 79%. Not bad for green thumb industries. We'll leave it at that. I want to thank my guest, Katrina Glogowski, angel investor and attorney. Thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out. 
check out these other videos that we've got.